much. <laughs> Before all of that, we're looking through today's Good Friday papers with Vanessa Feltz and Isla Traquare. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I want to start um, with Thames Water because we're constantly hearing about water companies in the press. Um, the boss of water, uh, Thames Water has warned of a 40% rise in bills to keep the firm going. Now, Chris Weston told the BBC the price hike was the price customers have to pay for the investment in our infrastructure that's needed. I mean, it is very much needed. It's been needed for a long time. We constantly hear about surfers against sewage. Mm -hmm. We certainly do. Um, I mean, this, this is a scandalous story, really. And what's been going on for years and years is this. The private investors in Thames Water and, indeed, all the other water companies too, have been paid the most phenomenal and abundant dividends. Yeah. So if you've been a shareholder, gosh, it's been Christmas almost every day of your life. You're earning an absolute stack from your shares in Thames Water and all the other water companies. But what hasn't happened is the repairing of the infrastructure, you know, the numerous leaks all over the place, and most particularly this, these awful sewage leaks into our rivers and into our seas, which have to be addressed, only they just haven't been. Now, Thames Water is saying, well, you know, yes, we will address them, but hey, you better pay for it, you consumers of the water, not you who have been um, so handsomely rewarded all these years for yeah. being our shareholders. I mean, there's some surfers that have had to have their stomach pumped yeah. because yeah, of the raw ghastly. sewage going into our seas at the moment. And, and you know, dividends are being paid out like this, I And know. they are blaming the Victorian sewage system, which it does need replaced, but they should have looked at this a long time ago. This is not a case of, oh, we've got this, you know, we've inherited this problem. They have badly managed. I mean, the amount of money they've taken out in these dividends, I think is about is it seven billion over the years. The boss of this company is close to a million in salary plus bonuses. And then we are being told as customers, now we have no choice. I can't choose another water provider. I live in London. It's, it's Thames. Not, it's and it's not Thames. It's a monopoly. It's, it's, it's an like, absolute monopoly. But the thing I think that you just cannot understand about this is, how can a water company not be in profit? We have to have water. It's, yeah. a, it's obligatory. Yeah. We can't yeah. survive without it. So they ought to be absolutely in the black and, and yeah. trading at a terrific profit if only they had ploughed some of the money they were making from us into the company. Here's the question. Are the investors... Should they carry some responsibility here? Because basically the investors in Thames Water... I mean, you, you can get onto a whole other argument as to whether our natural resources should even be owned yes. by yeah, yeah. anyone else but the people in the state, right? Mm. But should the investors not carry some responsibility here? They've been taking dividends out for so long. Um, they won't give the Thames Water the money to, to reinvest. I they're, mean, what's actually going to happen is, is a standoff between Ofwat, who is the regulators who are yeah. supposed to regulate this, and in my opinion, it's only my view, seem to have been asleep on the job for years and mm -hmm. years and allowed but this to, what, to what happen. Is... But there's going to be a standoff between the shareholders and Ofwat, and it might happen that the government will in the end take over. But if that happens, the shareholders will lose all the money that they put in, in the, over the years. Yeah. So I, I reckon that that's not going to happen, but I think we might see a standoff. It's going to be like, you know, something on like the OK Corral. It's going to be... Look, we don't have an awful lot of money, right, in mm. this country. However, is there not an argument for renationalisation? Absolutely, and it is possible to do it. There's a special administration system, and it can be done. We've seen with so the railway. So I do think that we should do that. And just to, to, to mention that you're mentioning off what mm. there, one of off what's remits is to protect the shareholders' investment. So that seems a little bit off right, as yeah. well. The whole so thing's a bit off, isn't it, it? it? It's all off. It's a monopoly. It's a disgrace. Yes. And it's complicated and there's a lot of money involved, but we're the ones who are suffering and the surfers. Yeah, yeah. Um, OK, let's move on. Um, a barrister and former beauty pageant winner has claimed the term glamorous is offensive and sued a boss for discrimination. The tribunal has found the word was potentially a breach of workplace laws. However, the East London Employer Tribunal dismissed her case. So employment judge Sophie Park said in the business context, we've concluded that being described as glamorous is potentially inappropriate. Looked at objectively, it could be taken as um, undermining or belittling to the persons described, making them seem less serious and professional. I don't know the backdrop to this, but where I do you do. stand on I'll it? tell you the backdrop, and I think context is key. This is yeah. a, she's a solicitor, but she's a former beauty queen, and she is beautiful, and she presents herself very well, and oh, she's gorgeous. entitled and allowed to do that. She's gorgeous. And it was a female boss who was referring to go, giving a tour of the office and had complimented her previously about her appearance and said, here's the glamorous cord, corner. Now, she's a solicitor, she's obviously got brains and she's not in that office for, for her looks. Um, and I think I personally, if a woman was saying that to me, I would take that as a compliment, as long as they're not belittling my intelligence. You know, uh, we How have... How do you feel if a man was saying it to you? 
In, in exactly well, the same I, context, you, just out of curiosity. But you probably have said to me, Isla, I like your dress, you look very glamorous. I'm sure you've said that to me. And I no, take that as not a... not going to go to HR, is it? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I take that as a compliment. I dress in, you know, my schlumpies at home when I'm editing. When I come in here, I put on a nice dress. So do you, so, you know, well, you sometimes wear a dress, Dermot, but that's in private. <laughs> but I <laughs> want to be, I want to look nice. And I, I like it if someone compliments me. I think it would have been different if it was a... Uh, uh, an older male boss who then just identified her as that, but this is a woman. So I think context is key. And I don't, I think I agree with the tri tribunal. And I think it's just, you know, it, 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 do, it does depend if what, what sex you are and how you're saying in the context. But I wouldn't be offended. Would you be offended, Vanessa? I'd be delighted, <laughs> absolutely <laughs> delighted. I'd be thrilled to pieces if somebody said that to me in any context, anywhere, at any time. If they say you look glamorous, I'd be absolutely thrilled. And I, and I think the idea that it's potentially belittling is rather a shame, because as, mm. as, as, as we said quite clearly, it's possible to be bright and glamorous, mm -hmm. or glamorous and not bright. It just depends on what's going on. And this mm. woman's a lawyer, of course she's bright. Mm. So it, it, it seems a shame to take these things as a personal insult yeah. if they're not yeah. really intended that way. If someone called me glamorous, I'd totally own it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you are enjoy. glamorous. Well, you are. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ella. <laughs> um, now, our next story. Now, um, I don't know if there's, you know, places um, to have Easter egg hunts, but uh, Cemetery maybe certainly not is one. So, uh, Cemetery Easter egg hunt has been cancelled. Um, this is a Victorian cemetery, um, and it was cancelled after a backlash from families of people buried there. Um, it was in the Wrexham Cemetery in North Wales. Um, do you, what do you think about that, well, Vanessa? I Easter egg hunt in a there's cemetery. the idea of, you know, the time and the place. And, and you know, when, when people are buried, I certainly, you know, I go and visit my mother's grave twice a year, and that's, that's kind of what the custom um, demands. And you feel as if it's a kind of consecrated, holy, solemn kind of a place and not necessarily the perfect location for a giggling, great fun Easter egg hunt. I mean, do I think that the dead would be disturbed by it? No. Do I think that there's any reason really that any piece of land is any holier than any other? Not particularly. But do I think there are times and places and it's not really decorous? And also, if you've just lost somebody, you know, people feel a great deal of comfort visiting a grave of somebody that's just newly departed. And if you've got a load of children, you know, looking for a, a Cadbury's cream egg behind you, just, you know, yeah. recently departed relative's grave, maybe you wouldn't like it. So I think, you well, know, it, somewhere else is probably better. It was a Victorian cemetery, well, wasn't I, it? Yeah, I was going to say, the background of the cemetery is it's uh, 1876, there's 39,000 people who are buried there. I go to one of the Magnificent Seven every day, I walk my dog. I love the stories, they do tours, they do a lot of interactive, the, the what do you call it, the forest school, the little children with their yeah. little visors go around and learn. I want people to have a party on my grave because the reality is, well, whoever visits it, it's one generation and then it's gone. So I think learning the stories of those who've died, the, the, the organisers of it called it an outdoor museum for them. They want to learn about yeah. genealogy and they said that the children were going to be kept on the paths. Of course, they wouldn't go near any. I don't know if there are any recently buried people because it is a very old cemetery. So I think that we have limited green spaces as well in this country. And for some people, you know, where I'm in London, this is the main green space that is the cemetery. It's an arboretum. There's these beautiful trees. It's like a forest. Lovely. It's overgrown with ivy. Well, so it provokes I think... a conversation as to what we do with these spaces as they evolve and, and, yeah. and, and, and kind of time recedes. I would think the most extraordinary thing is when I am actually there, people taking calls on their smartphones while they're standing at the graves and yeah. barking into the phone, yes! You know, I'm at my dad's grave and you just think, where's the respect? Well, do you want know to know that? the best thing I've ever heard is um, the thought of putting a QR code on, on your gravestone so you can actually, you know, See the scan screen. it and look yeah. through their stories and all their pictures. How we, lovely is we that? Did, we did that story. Yeah. Do you know the company that does that uses us talking about it and I said I would haunt people. <laughs> Do you love it? Go, get off yeah. my grave. <laughs> Oh, like I have to haunt you. Yeah. Please download our QR. <laughs> uh, still to come, putting some mini egg pizza to the test. Vanessa and I are sticking with that and maybe trying it, I don't know. Uh, a lot more today. Stop stories. See you in a bit. Yes, plus we couldn't celebrate Good Friday without a visit from our Reverend Kate Botley joins us on the sofa a little later. We'll see you right after this. <laughs> 